many of you this morning can say that you have experienced his faithfulness this week? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We've just had some really good reports on a lot of different things, and I'm so excited that the goodness of God is following us all the days of our life. His goodness is running after us. Hallelujah. He's just waiting right there to give us what we need, what our, our heart's desire is. And I appreciate him today. Hallelujah. And if you're believing for something, hang in there. It is on its way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I'll take you back. Oh, we worship God.
bless your holy name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. If we stood here all day long, we couldn't tell all the good things that God has done because we wouldn't have the time. But he is so mighty. He's so faithful in every area of our life. So if you're facing a situation today, keep standing. The Bible says when you've done all that you know to do, stand therefore in the faith that God has placed in you and let him move in your behalf. Hallelujah. I have a testimony. Go ahead. Um, uh, Oh, since dad's been in the hospital, um, you know, um, none of my family wanted to see him there and, and as uh, some think that maybe I waited too long to put him in the hospital. I had a niece that uh, turned me in for negligence, I guess might be the word to say. I don't know. Anyway, um, that hurts, you know, because trying to make all the right decisions for him in a timely manner, you know, because it was brutally cold out there, sub-minus temperatures there for a while. We had snow and you know, any of the wrong moves could give him pneumonia, you know. So, you know, he was doing well, you know. He'd make great comebacks, even though he had little fevers. But um, one week, or maybe it was two weeks prior before taking him to the hospital, I was making some calls to some of the family to come and visit, you know, because I told him, you know, it might not be long, and... So anyway, my one of one of the twins, one of the older sisters, uh, uh, she came and her husband, and and I had took off work so that I could be with them when they came over to visit with them, you know, and and they hadn't been over for a long time, and they end up spending four hours with us. We made a dinner and and uh, really enjoyed their company. They got to be with dad and spend some time with him. Well, during this process, when uh, um. She turned us in. Um, they end up being the ones that was there whenever the social worker came in the hospital, and I guess he had tried asking questions, nurses, doctors, and such. But anyway, uh, <laughs> my brother-in-law told him that, no, we're the people that you need to see. This is what counts. We were there, and whenever we needed to go see our children in activities, we'd call Juan and Junior to come over and sit with him, you know. So they they were there. They seen. They said, we're the witnesses. And that we didn't fail, Dad, and that we done the best that we could. I just praise and I thank the Lord for His timely manner because all things are always in His hands no matter where you're at with Him. He is great and He's mighty and He's always looking out for you. I think about this the scripture where he says that God is mindful of the sparrows, how much more is he mindful for us? He loves us. And I praise you. And I thank him for his goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Father. I want us to do something different today. Uh, we were driving to Mountain View years ago and Linda's taught me a lot about nature. I was born on a lot bigger farm than she was, but well, she can tell when it's going to rain, when it's going to snow, and all that stuff. I said, you, you're better than a meteorologist. I mean, you just, she said, well, just look at nature, the, the birds, and she tells me what they do. Well, anyway, we was on the way to Mountain View one day, and she says, getting ready to rain. I said, well, how do you know? She said, look at the leaves. They got their, their, they got their the leaves are turned up. And I, I was thinking back there in worship a while ago how that, you know, the Lord says we're, we're trees of the Lord, the planting of the Lord. So I want you to do something while you're sitting in their seat, just something a little different. I want you to turn your cups up. You don't have to raise your hands like this. Just turn your cups up as we sing this song. It's beginning to rain. Hear the voice of
19 years old, 18, 19, 18, getting a, getting a clean bill of health after having lung cancer. Uh, Dave has a good report. Uh, on, my, on my report, doctor said my PSA was elevated, and so he thought, you know, he said, we want to stay ahead of cancer. That's the big word everybody's scared of. So he checked and he said, well, it's really, really swollen a lot. And you've got a growth on the side of your prostate. So I went and had a sonogram done. And they said, no, you got two growths, one on each side. So this is still part of the story. It looks like I'm getting off. But we was down at the house and the, the guy laying the rock on our house, the Mexican guy, speaking enough English that we could understand him. <laughs> And uh, the power went out in Harrisonville for four hours, so he couldn't mix his mud and do what he needed to do. So we just stand there talking. He was, he was getting apprehensive because he told the builder he would be done with that job tonight, and he says, they've got the power shut off. I can't use my saw to cut the rock and so forth. I said, we're the, we're the homeowners. We're not pushing you. It's okay. So while we're standing there talking, I said something about the church and, and uh, I said, you go to church? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I go. He said, I was raised in Mexico. We didn't go in Mexico. I said, you want to raise Catholics? He said, no, not most, most Hispanics are. But he said, we weren't. We weren't, we weren't nothing. I said, oh, okay. So he said, we come to America and, and um, invited me to church. I don't want to church. I'd rather just stay home and drink and, you know, get rid of my troubles for the weekend and but he said they kept on and so finally I went he said they laid hands on me and I never had that before he says I just went down he said want to come up 
raised up. I was speaking in tongues. He said, I guess I got the whole thing, you know. So anyway, so we just start asking questions. And he said, the, the preacher asked me to speak on a Sunday night. And he says, I, I take off work early and I go home and I pray and I read the Bible and I get nothing. And he says, I go read the Bible some more. I get nothing. I go pray some more. I get nothing. And he says, it's getting close to time to start and I'm getting scared. He said, he handed me the microphone and it just came on me. And uh, he started talking about praying for people and they were healed. And so Linda stepped up and she said, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Told him my situation about the prostate. We were standing outside that day and it was pretty cold and I had a pretty thick uh, leather jacket on. He just put his hand right there and I just felt fire completely through my body. And uh, end of that story. So I go back to the prostate doctor, and he said, well, you got three choices. He said, if you're 75, I'd say just, you are, you'd probably outlive it. But you're in that twilight zone. So he said, I would go have an have a MRI or a, a biopsy, thank you, or a biopsy. And I said, what would you do? He said, well, I'm 20 years younger. <laughs> I said, well, let me see. Let's do the MRI. So I went and had an MRI, and so I went back and seen him this week. Well, I did the MR Tuesday, and thir Friday I seen, seen the doctor, and he says, pull up a chair, and he straddled that chair, and he said, hmm, uh, have good news. You have no gross <laughs> on your prostate. He said, it's a, little, it's a little swollen, but he said, it is for anybody your age. So he's, he said, I'd go home and maybe come back in a year. <laughs> So, you know, he, he had something to go by. He had a picture, you know. It wasn't just guesswork. So I thank the Lord for those things. And it helps me to see in other issues when, it, when we seem to come to an impasse that he'll always see us through. He'll always see us through. Amen. Amen. You got a song. All of us cancer patients have to go all through this stuff. And a few weeks ago, after I got through all this radiation treatments and stuff, I told Mike and Norm about this, that I had to go in for labs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I went in, had an appointment with the urologist. And I went in to the urologist, and he never did come in the office. All I ever seen was a nurse. Of course, you should have pulled out a needle about that long and gave me another shot. But, but then the next, very next day, I had an appointment with my primary physician. Of course, it's, nowadays it's, on, it's a FaceTime call. And I finally got around to asking, I says, what was my numbers on my labs? And he says, you know, it's a funny thing. He says, your numbers on your PSA was so low that they couldn't even count them. <laughs> so that's what you catch your paces. If you keep your eyes on the Lord yeah. and his promises, that's what you've got. Amen. You're, it, the Lord will take this thing. Amen. 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 Yeah, very good. Are you tired? 
This coming up Saturday is our Easter egg hunt. Um, we do, we will be having all kinds of activities other than the Easter egg hunt. Um, but we do ask that you guys bring cookies. Um, I have a sign, well, Grandma printed out a sign-up sheet just so we know uh, how many cookies to count on so we can make up for whatever we don't make. Um, but it is from 3 to 5 on Saturday. Um, there will be hot dogs, popcorn, chips, drinks, all of that. So we hope that you guys will come out and we hope to see you guys there. Amen. The sign-up sheet, I'm going to put it right here. Amen. Steve, it's good to see you today, buddy. Is this something you took off from work or <laughs> your schedule changed? All right, all right. I see a lady back here that I don't think I know, but I'll get introduced here. 
And you are? Sandra? What's the last name? Decker. Decker. Bless you. Thanks for coming. Amen. You're very important. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, we believe in that around here. I saw something. Uh, everybody's special. Everybody's special. But this little girl right here wins my heart. She, she worships the Lord. And I watched her lips. She never missed a word. I don't know if the girl could read or not. But <laughs> she never missed a word. She said she, you can't, she can't read. Sweetheart, I want to tell you something. I don't know if you'll ever remember this or not. But God's got a call on your life and worship. And it started at this age. You know, every doctor that's a good doctor, he wants to be a doctor since he's a little boy. That's a calling. Some do it for money. Some do it because that's, that's the call of God. But God's going to use you, sweetheart. You that have her in your class, get her involved in worship if you do that back there. She has something to offer. She offered me a dessert this morning just watching her <laughs> and I seen the rest of you were singing I, 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 Chris I'll see you singing every word of those songs <laughs> I, I know some of them might be new but anyway I appreciate that Amen. I just appreciate participation this is a participation game and I, not just a spectator but I see you participating it's it's wonderful Amen. Wonderful. Amen. Kay, I didn't mention having you last Sunday, but are you back up here for good or what's the deal? What? Don't know. Don't know, no. <laughs> I'm here right now. Okay. Some of you know her husband died a year ago? Yeah. Anyway, I've known this girl since she was, I started to say since she was short. <laughs> since she was shorter. <laughs> uh, when her husband died, she dated David a little bit, is that right? Yeah. And I called David and I said, "Do you know Jim?" She know he knew her husband too. And I said, "You you know Jim Bob passed away?" He said, "Yeah, he stole my girlfriend." <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Okay, good to see you, sweetheart. Amen. And this fellow over here is Carrie Kingsland, right? Yes, sir. I tell you, we had a good fellowship last night. He lives at Springfield and. God's took him through, we talked about all the camps we come through and, and our journey in the spirit. But your worship today ministered to me. You didn't hold back just because you're new. He really worshiped. And you know what? I heard a preacher say one time at a, at a large gathering, he said, uh, they introduced him, he said, now, uh, for the most important part of the service, we're having speaker so and so's gonna speak. He got up to speak, he took the microphone, he said, I don't want to refute anything he said, but he said, the most important part of the service is not the preaching, it's the worship. If you don't worship, preaching just becomes dead letter. But when you worship, it's like cultivating your heart. And you prepare your heart for the sowing of the seed. As, as most of you know, I'm kind of the out-of-the-box guy. And sometimes you got it stretches you a little bit to even understand my perspective. And it might stretch me to understand yours. But anyway, together we're growing in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Some of you come through a different list of camps than I come through. But it's bringing us to a oneness in Him. That's what it's doing. And, and uh, I was talking to... Uh, Carrie last night about I come through the Word of Faith camp and he said he did too and I said you know it, it offered me a lot it brought me uh, it brought me to an awareness of the kingdom of God bigger in my denomination that I was involved in growing up and uh, I saw a group of people in that camp that was uh, all about the love of God and grace and I'd hear people talk against them and I just want to fight for them and I'd get all aggravated and finally I'd decide oh you know that's just the way the Lord brought me. Some, he brought somebody else another way. But anyway, he's bringing us to, to a togetherness in him. Yes. 
in him. Amen. Amen. Kids, you can go to class. Come on up here. We uh, <clears throat> sang that song about the rain. And... Um, uh, Included in the song, it talks about dryness. Well, it's not a doom and gloom song, you know. But it did mention dryness. Because you get that contrast between the refreshing rain and the dryness. And uh, for a number of years, Merle and I were in an African country, small country. Um, it was called Rhodesia then. It's called Zimbabwe now. Never mind. But... Uh, we go through a period of the year of a couple of months where it would be a great blessing if the temperature dropped below 100. And it was day after day after day. And I mean, it was burning hot. We didn't have air. Um, we didn't have electricity. We had a washer, which I rigged up to a lawnmower engine. <laughs> and it worked. Um, but there was one thing that our gaze, if you want to call it that, was fixed upon. It's going to rain. Every year it rains. But uh, during those months after winter, when we call it, you know, spring, we don't give it a nice name like that over there. It's just so hot. It just burns you up and burns you up and burns you up until the rains come. And you know, the, the amazing thing is, two or three days before the rains arrive, you can smell them coming. That smell. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does someone know? You can smell the sm of dry ground being wet by the rain. And you know it's coming. And you're assured that it's coming. Because it happens every year. And, and the Lord's blessing is like that, you know. Yeah, you smell it coming. But sometimes that experience that leads you to smell it coming is not all that pleasant, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not pleasant to be diagnosed with cancer. It's not a whoop de doo thing. But it kind of wrenches you out of the everyday and, and makes you so aware of how vulnerable you really are. You know? And so, you know, in one sense, a testimony is a measure of a negative situation. And then, uh, and then the hope that you have. And then it came to pass. You know? So, so that's, the, that's the, 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 the makeup of a testimony. And uh, um, you, 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 you hear very few testimonies that sound like, well, I come from a very wealthy family. You know, I had more money than I ever knew what I wanted to do with, you know. And then Uncle Sam died and left me another 10 million. whoop de doo <laughs> You know, you, it's always a measure of your vulnerability, your helplessness. And then God steps in. And then this is what happened, you know. I was just thinking of that when we sang that song about the rain coming. Amen. Amen. Good point. You can rest your plane this morning, please. Amen. <coughs> well, you
just remind you, uh, September the, September, where did I get that at? I guess off the calendar. Uh, Sunday, May the 23rd, we're going to honor Jr. He's not here today, but uh, I guess he got called into work. He got home at 2 this morning. Okay, that's what it was. Anyway, he's cooking, and he loves it. And that's, you know, that's his calling. You know, I took him on trips, and I said, Jr., what would you do, how would you make a casserole? And he just started, it, it didn't make sense to me. But he'd say all the, he'd tell all the ingredients he'd do it, and I'd do this, and I'd cook it at whatever temperature. He lost me on the first one, but anyway, that's his calling. But we're going to honor him that Sunday, uh, Sunday, uh, May the 23rd, uh, for his 12th gra- graduation. Our special speaker that, that Sunday will be Willie Hudson. Willie is a coach and director of culture and enrichment over at Ozanam. They, he graduated midterm and this coach spoke. I was so impressed, so impressed. He just, he chucked God in every, almost every sentence in that whole, that whole uh, speaking engagement. I was, and I told him later, I said, man, I want you to come speak at church. And would you do that? And he said, I will, I'll do that. Anyway. Today, I'd like to talk to you about maintaining joy during a pandemic. I'd rather call it a plandemic, and the reason I do, anytime they can generate a virus, patent it and sell it, it's planned. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't bother people. It is a virus. But... uh, I'm not going to talk about the virus today as near as much as I'm going to talk about how to maintain joy during that. And try to use the scriptures to, to uh, verify it and qualify it. And uh, I want to say on the onset of this, the Bible is written largely in a pictorial language. It uses pictures to, uh, to define certain things, and um, let's go to Proverbs chapter 5, just, I want to give you about four or five little examples before we get into the message, and the message won't be long, so uh, Isaiah, or Proverbs 5, Proverbs 5, okay, in Proverbs 5, <coughs> It says, My son, attend to my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understandings, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman droppeth as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of, of life, her ways are movable, in other words, very unsteady, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O children, and depart from the words and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. I'll stop there. Here he's talking about the life of a prostitute. But when you study and understand uh, the spiritual aspect of this, we understand that he's talking about the mind. The mind, the will, the emotions, the soul of a person. Uh, I've said for, for several years now, we, we read about the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation, right? And it's not, it's not a marriage supper of turkey and dressing. Because in heaven, you don't need to eat, right? You with me so far? So it's, we know just in the natural, it isn't that. But this is what the Lord ministered to me. And I, I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm just asking you to, I'm suggesting you to think about it. The real married supper of the Lamb is when my soul, the she, and my heart, the he, gets married. 
when my soul, the suke, the soul of my, is kind of like a mediator. It can take in things and hear things and see things, and sometimes it's contrary to what my heart knows. And sometimes we follow the mind that says, oh, it's okay. It's okay this time. No, it's not okay. But when my spirit and my soul... See, God's always referred to most generally in the male gender, and your soul is always referred to in the female gender. So when the spirit and the soul gets married, mm, there's no telling what you can do in the spirit when there's not this fight going on constantly. That's why we say study the scriptures. Know what the Bible says about situations. Then we'll, we'll, we'll say those things and act on them. Look at John chapter 4 in the New Testament. And we'll start at verse 10. Here Jesus had went, left the disciples and went, they had went to buy, buy bread and meat in town. And Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And while he was going through Samaria and he, he met this lady and uh, Jesus said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God who, is, who it is that saith to you, give me drink to drink, thou wouldest have asked him and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep. For whence then hast thou living water? Now remember, Jesus is sitting at the well. Wouldn't you normally think he's talking about the water there? You remember what we taught last Sunday? How God's building his churches through revelation. She needed a revelation of what water he's really talking about. He ain't talking about the water in the hole in the ground. Because he says in verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I give, shall give him, shall, he'll never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He doesn't mean there's going to be a, an artesian well inside of you. But what he's saying, if you understand the work of Christ, you see, some people still, still serving Jesus. I'm not taking away from Jesus. You understand, he went back into Father. What's in the earth now? The Christ, right? The Christ. That's the Spirit of God. So he's not talking about some kind of a well that's going to make you go to the bathroom 20 times a day. He's talking about, he, simula, he, he symbolizes that. He said, if you'll drink of my, the water that I give you, it'll be like, he don't say that, but he said, be in him a well of, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. If you partake of the Christ... If you partake of the, the work of Christ, understand what Jesus, or Christ, Jesus, you know, I don't want to leave Jesus out of it, but I don't serve him particularly as much as I do the Spirit of God. Jesus is all well and wonderful. He, he, we'll get into that next Sunday in Resurrection. He just, he changed the whole scope of life for everybody. But he's ascended into the Father, but he left something here, the Spirit that draws all men to Christ. He said, if you'll just drink of what I'm going to give you, it'll be in you like a spring of living water, springing up into everlasting life. Go to the 7th chapter of John, and a couple verses there, 37, 38, 39. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Again, he's not talking about physical water because the next line in verse 39 says, But this spake he of the Spirit. Something about partaking of just, you know, some of you got your cups up this morning. I remember when Joyce used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> she got them up. She come from Red Bridge Baptist Church and then, she progressed to this, <laughs> and she progressed to this, <laughs> and I saw her back to this morning. She just didn't care who was watching you. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, sometimes it just has to grow on us, but as you partake of Christ, you say, why do you raise your hands for? Why, why do you do that? That's just a sign of, of uh, surrender. It's just an outward, visible sign of surrender, and you got to do that constantly. 
It's a constant in today's world. I'm telling you what, I can't imagine the things that's thrown at our young people. I can't even imagine it. When I went to school, uh, you know, boys had their shirt tails in and sure didn't go preach with your shirt tail out. If boys wore their shirt tails in, you had to have a belt on. Ladies and girls all wore dresses and, you know, that was a diff different time. They didn't have ball games on Wednesday night because that was church night. But everybody went to church. And so it's a different day today. Totally different day today. So God is in the midst of every time, time frame, right? We just got to adjust to it sometimes. Anyway, if we partake of him as we just worship the Lord, sometimes my greatest revelation is just when I just just not even thinking about a scripture, just driving down the road and, and just singing in the spirit and, and the Lord will speak up. I've told you this story before, but I'm going to tell you again. I was about to do something in my business that cost $50,000. And I justified it and I could accomplish my goal by getting $50,000 to do that. I'm driving down the road just praying in the spirit and the Lord spoke up in me and gave me another plan that I accomplished the same thing with $0. just by changing a few of my ways of doing things. That's, that's like a spring of living water that, that you draw from, you know. And I didn't even realize, man, it didn't cost me a dime to do that. Here I was ready to spend $50,000 to do that. God is just faithful. He's faithful. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. These, these kind of are a little launching pad here. 1 Corinthians 3, <clears throat> verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk. Now really, G Paul did not give them a glass of milk. That's a type. He gave them, he gave them stuff that they could digest. Okay? He said, I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither you're, he said, you're still not able to bear it. And here's why. Verse 3 says, For you're yet carnal. Whereas among you there's envies and strives and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? What he's talking about, you're still walking as you're, you're believers, you trust the Lord, but you're still having these divisions and you're still having these, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, envies and strives and divisions and all that. You're carnal. And I looked up the word carnal a few years ago, and it says that which is external. I thought, oh, my gosh. Everything about me is carnal. Here I was pastoring a church, believed in the Lord, believed in the power of the Spirit, but everything about me was external. God was there. The devil was there. Heaven up there. Hell down there. Everything was external from me. When I realized, come to realization a few years ago, that this work of the Spirit is an internal work. It's not an external work. It's an internal work. And God probably lives out there someplace, and I'm not denying that, but for the most important part, I need to know He lives here. So my my... I got out of my carnality and began to realize the work of the Holy Spirit is always in here. God is in here. And you know what? If God is in here, that's, if God lives here, that's where His throne is. I don't need I might have a throne somewhere 50 miles below Mar or the other side of Mars. That's okay. But, you know, His throne's in here. And if His throne's in here... That's where heaven is. It also could be that's where hell is if I don't trust the Lord, if I'm not committed to the Lord. I've, I've uh, been around mechanics and people working on their trucks and been in the trucking industry, and, and uh, I'll say, what's going on here? Oh, he said, I don't know. He said, he said uh, going to hell, I guess, if I don't change my ways. I, I've learned to say, are you in hell now? He said, you know, I am. I, 
I said, you know, God's here to change that for you. It's partaking of the work of Christ. And in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, you're carnal. There's envy, there's strife, there's divisions. You still walk like men who haven't re- accepted the Lord, who haven't a- activated what God's already done for them. For while one says, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers of whom you believed, even as the Lord gave you gave to every man. Now Paul says, I planted. He ain't talking about seeds. He ain't talking about something you get in a little sack at, at uh, the feed store. He's talking about the word. He says, I planted the seed. He calls the word the seed. It's a, pict- it's a picture. It's a pictorial language. He said, I planted an Apollos water. It means he come along with a water bucket. He come along with another word behind him that watered in the spirit what he had already planted. So when you have a tendency to share with somebody, oh, maybe I better not, don't just manipulate a conversation and get God in. They feel that. But when it's spontaneous, feel free to share because you may be the one that's watering somebody else's seed. Or you may be sowing a seed and you see no difference. I like something that Ken Copeland said many, probably 40 years ago, I heard him say, when you preach the word, I don't care if no one responds. If you preach it sincerely, the word has the seed, of, the, the word is a seed, and it has the eternal power of God in it. Now, they may not change for six months or a year or two years or five years, but that seed is going to sprout and grow somewhere. Somebody else is going to come along and water it. Someone else may say something that will nurture that. It will spring forth and grow. So don't be moved if you share with somebody and they act like they didn't even hear you. You know, you sowed the seed. It's powerful. Amen. All right. Let's start today. Ephesians chapter 6. Maintaining joy during a pandemic. You see, Jesus even referred to himself as the bread of life. He didn't go start gnawing on him, but the words he said feed you. Amen? So in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start with verse 10. Now when Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus, there's lots of things. Um, sometimes we, we tend to think that somebody wrote this yesterday for us today. And it has, it's, it's appropriate to receive it that way. But Paul's writing to some folks here that were struggling in Ephesus. There was a lot of opposition there, and there's a lot of things, that's envies and strifes that was coming in and all that kind of stuff. So Paul's in prison. Let's get the picture here. Paul's in prison. He's wrote these letters to the churches while he's in prison. And his final letter here to the church at Ephesus, he says, Finally, my brethren... First of all, be strong how? In the Lord. Lord. And in the power of what? His might. Before he told you anything else. That will get you a long ways. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. And while he's pinning that, now I'm just hypothetically, he's he's in this jail. Now, the Bible don't say this. I just get a picture in my mind. He looks up and he sees this Roman soldier, this Roman guard. And he just gets a vision. This is kind of the way it ought to be. Put on the whole armor of God. He's look at this guy. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of strategy of the devil. Did you re- realize the word devil comes from the... It's, that's our English word. It's been given to Diopolis, which means traducer or liar. Or I think I made a note of that somewhere here. Um, I didn't. Anyway, the word uh, we get the word devil from the Greek word diopolis, diopolis, diopolis. I will get it. Anyway, which means traducer or liar or accuser. Now, I will use uh, I've used Crystal a lot of times. We'll use Terry over here this time. <laughs> 
If Terry messes up, whatever messing up is to you, if he messes up, who's his worst enemy? Himself. When you mess up, you're your worst enemy, right? If we can just somehow or another accept the responsibility of what we did and just make it right. You know, sometimes people just want to wallow in that for months and months and months and months and months and never, and never a benefit to anybody, especially to themselves. So I'm suggesting to you, I'm not telling you to believe it. I'm telling you just think about this. Maybe the biggest devil that you have is this gray matter right here. Maybe, you know, Paul also said, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. He told how to do it, by the renewing of your mind. Sometimes we need to renew our mind to, what does the Bible say about this? Is this, you know, every generation, we go down through history, every generation thinks they're the last one. We had an older preacher when I was growing up, and his generation was the last one. But my dad was a young man. We had these four kids, and later another kid come along when I was married. But uh, that dad thought his generation was the last one. It's just common knowledge. Most people think if they go to church very long, thinks their generation is the last one. Because they think, you know, read in there about the last days. Well, the last days started, if you, you look in the scripture, I believe it's Genesis 49, it speaks of the last days. The last days is nothing more, and I don't want to belittle it, but it's nothing more than the end of a time. It's end of an age, end of a, a um, chorus. Uh, you know, I hated English in school, but it was just a, one semester in college. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> I just bought in a chair. I'd come home and ask Linda, questions. How do you know it's a predicate? What's a predicate? <laughs> she, was, I said, she would tell me it still didn't make no sense. You know, <laughs> I did learn on nouns and pronouns and, and adjectives and I finally got those straight. But I, I was just a body and chair in English, but it was just a course. I mean, a time frame. When that semester is over, whoo, I was done. I minus got me, <laughs> got me out of there, but Dad made me get better than I minus, but <laughs> anyway, end of the, in the last days is, is the end of a time frame, end of an age, and we've, we've come to understand that in, in government, in the economics, in the school systems, and everything, things have changed. I even had a doctor's visit, as, as uh, Dave said a while ago, just a Facebook time. That wasn't on my prostate, but on another issue. You know, as times have changed, and and I I I, uh, I get pretty perturbed and seeing commercial after commercial after commercial telling you what you need to take. Well, I don't reckon that you need a doctor if you're going to believe all that, you know. <laughs> so it's just we got all this stuff coming at us. Young people have all this stuff coming at them, and some and Paul puts a tells us how to handle this. And I'm just going to pull off these pages what he said to the Ephesians because they were looking at the, uh, the, the 70 AD right in front of them, not too many years after this, when, when this whole Jerusalem was destroyed. And he was talking about another situation. But I want to tell you something. I have to look, even though this wasn't written to me, it's written for me. If it's written for me, then I can glean something out of this. So in the middle of a pandemic, I have to say, I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood. I'm wrestling against ideas. I'm wrestling against a mindset that some people read a book about 40 years ago and thinks it's a wonderful to, to get our nation involved in that mindset. We, we read this book and found out that don't work, right? So, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Now listen, 
I not only heard this, I preached it. So I'm not throwing stones at anybody. But when I would read, we're we're wrestling against principalities and against powers. I would say this this really means, and I've said it this way in sermons, this really means it's a it's a, a whole order of demons. From the head demon down to the peewee demon, you know. We're wrestling against all of that. But I stumbled on something. Colossians chapter 2. And I want to read what Colossians chapter 2 says. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For you are complete in him which is the which is the head of all, what? Hmm. For you're complete in him, which is the head of all again, principality and power. Now notice, verse 11, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, you know, the Jews were were big on on circumcision. That was the token of the covenant. But Paul is saying circumcision... Now is not the circumcision of that male organ, but it's the circumcision of the heart. It's the circumcision of the heart. He said, In whom you also are, are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of who? Christ. Of Christ. Buried with him how? Wherein, the rest of you help join in here now. Wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the what? The dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven forgiven you all what? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. You see, under the old covenant they kept a record. I, I uh, mentioned uh, last Sunday w- one particular thing that uh, I I learned is in stringent oral law, if you took over five steps on the Sabbath in the same direction, it was wa- it was working. Now, Ken sh- or no, Carrie sh- shared with me last night if you wa- if you walked over a quarter of a mile, half a mile, they considered that working. <coughs> well, he says he blotted that stuff out. Blot out all the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, here's where my point about uh, Ephesians says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Uh, he said, and having spoiled what? Principalities. And what? He spoiled what? Okay, he spoiled what? Thank you, it's getting better. He spoiled what? All right. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When did he do that? Hanging on the cross. He spoiled. That ain't like giving them all good things like we spoil kids. <laughs> you know, you see a kid that's given everything, he said, white kid's spoiled. Now, it's not talking about that kind of spoil, it's it tri- he triumphed. He he he, uh, he blotted out the, the the all the ordinances against us. He blotted them out on the on, hanging on the cross. So when I read that, I began to see we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. So I looked I looked that up in the concordance, and it has the word magistrate as one of the definitions. Magistrate. An officer, it says, an officer empowered to administer and enforce the law. And powers, the word powers in the concordance has the same word, magistrate. It says superhuman potentate to take control. Seems like that would be pretty appropriate of today. Even though Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, that seems like what's going on today in our political world. Forcing the conservatives not to speak, doing things where their voice can't be heard, fake news, 
and showing it as if they were the great potentate. This is all the way it is. I thought, the Lord, Paul, you just, a long time ago, it's pretty, pretty apropos to today. So, how do we maintain joy in the midst of this kind of things going on? He says, taking you the whole armor of God. He's probably still looking at that guard with all that stuff on. Take, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Loins is the productive, reproductive part of your body. He mentions that first. We know what the reproductive part of a male and a female is today. But in the spirit, it's not this part of your body. It's your mouth. Your mouth is where you give birth to th- words that you can see maybe months ago. I've heard guys say, I mean, Christian people say uh, getting in a pinch and they cuss or something. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Well, what I know by the Spirit is somewhere back here they conceived it. And it grew and grew and grew and under pressure they gave birth to that. But they gave birth to their mouth. Jesus says not what you take in. You know, that's not what defiles you, but what, what you say. What you say. Jesus said in another place, he said, uh, uh, let me get it, it's Matthew, I'll get it. Uh, I want to get it right. Matthew's Gospel, I have no idea where. It's there. You can, you can help me out. Found it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Matthew 12. <clears throat> Jesus said here in, in verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and the evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And I wrote out here in my Bible, who's the judge? The next verse is the answer. For by thy words thou shalt be what? By your words shalt be what? I'm still with justified here. You're jumping ahead of me. (laughs) All right. For by thy words thou shalt be what? Justified. By your words you'll be justified. By your words thou shalt also be what? Condemned. So your words become the judge, according to Jesus. And I've got a lot of trust in what he says. Your words become the judge. So he says, stand therefore... Having your loins girt about with truth. Make sure everything about your your reproductive part in the spirit is always filled full of truth. We we had a uh, record years ago. The kids, we did even did some skits off of it. In this record, is this guy, he's, he's going to the hospital to visit a guy who's been, what was this? Yeah, he got hit by a bus and didn't kill him. So the guy went and went to the hospital in this record and he says, Now now think how 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 invigorating this would be. He says, Boy, he said, you're looking bad. He said, I had an uncle, he got killed by a truck. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to say to somebody suffering. You know, so have your your reproductive part of you that's reproductive in the spirit speak life I always if I go in somebody's room and they get in hospice and and uh, it looks like they're going to draw their last breath I still try to speak life always I 
told you about the guy that was dying and had cancer and uh, he's curled up in the bed like, a, like in a fetal position. Couldn't talk above a whisper. You had to just get your ear right down over him to hear what he said. I walked in the room and the hospice nurse was there and they just shaking their head. I never done this before in my life. I never done, done it before nor since. But I just crawled out of bed with the guy. I got right to straddle of him. <laughs> I put my hands down on each side of him, and I got down, and I said, You want to live or die? He said, Live. I said, Plan on it. I never even prayed for him. I thought well, after I left, I didn't even pray for him. <laughs> You know what, four days and the hospice nurse was done. They said, he's too well. He's living today. He's come and stood right there and gave his testimony. That's been 20 years ago because he planned on living. So you got to speak life. Speak life. In the most critical situation, you don't want to say, oh, well, you know, my aunt had that and it's pretty painful. She probably did and it was painful. I'm not making light of that. But that sick person don't need that kind of infusion. They need an IV in the spirit that has some kind of life in it. So gird your reproductive part of you in the spirit. Make sure it's full of truth. Make sure it's, it's what God says. Amen. It says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, the breastplate, this is the breast is where, people, where the babies get their her sustenance. You know, when a baby's breastfeeding, they have a lot of antibiotics and stuff given to them, and they're, they're a lot more healthy than people who put on baby food immediately. But he says, having on the, the breastplate of righteousness, that breastplate also covers the heart. You know, the Bible says in, in Proverbs, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you want life, speak what God speaks. Speak what God speaks. You know... <clears throat> I guess I got time for a little story here. I'll try to take five minutes. That's probably a seven-minute story. When I pastored at Salem, I had a lady there and did a wonderful job. And her time, we had we just hired her for a time frame. And uh, she knew that. We went into that operation, uh, saying, you know, we're good for this many weeks. Now after that, you're free to get a job or whatever you want to do. And uh, anyway, so time was getting running out, and I, I went to her, and I said, you know, our money's about out. Our money's running out. We got, we'll, we'll stay faithful to what we said, but you feel free. If you get a job offer before this time's up, you feel free to take it. It's okay. You've done a good job here. You did what we need done, yada, yada, yada. She, oh, she said, I'm just going to trust the Lord. I said, well, that's fine, but you got three kids at home. You know, feel free to get a, a job is okay. We don't have any more money after this. Well, she quit the church later and said we wouldn't pay her, and we had her, th we owed her a thousand dollars. And I was trying to keep the church's name clean, so uh, Linda and I just went to the bank and we borrowed a thousand dollars and gave it to her. But she still left the church and told other people we still owed her money. And I was so mad I could bit a nail in two. I wasn't very sanctified in my thinking my thought processes. Well, <clears throat> sometime later, I was mowing this big yard with a little tiny mower, and the Lord just dealt with me about this. And I'd push that mower, and I'd say, I love her. I love her. Hallelujah. I really love her. I really love her. And my mind said, you don't either. You're lying. I would, I would hear that voice. I said, I love her in the name of Jesus. I, you know you don't love her. You know you don't love her. She, look what she did. She, she, now, some people say that was the devil. I, I say it's an unrenewed mind, and I'm trying to conquer. You understand that? I'm trying to conquer that. So I'm, I'm overriding, letting my heart speak. My head wasn't married yet to that. My head was saying, no, you know you don't love her. Because I had bitter feelings for a long time, and I said, I was born in this grass. Yes, Lord, I love her in the name of Jesus. I love her. Thank you, Jesus. I love her. Hallelujah. I love her. No, you don't. You know you don't. No, you're lying. No, you're lying. And I just keep saying it. I was letting my heart rule. 
Remember, the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. I got that spot, big yard mowed down to about the size of this platform, and I stopped, and I don't know why, <laughs> you know, God's in here. I don't, I don't know why we always look up. <laughs> but anyway, I just looked up like that, and I said, Lord, if she'd come by my house, she could stay here, and it wouldn't be no problem. Well, about two weeks after that, guess who came? <laughs> Put me to the test. We had a nice visit. She stayed all night, her and her kids, and had a nice visit. And it was after dark when she left, and we had a long driveway. And she got to the end of the driveway, and I saw her taillights. I had just thought, you missed an opportunity to tell her how bad she treated you. <laughs> but I, she was already gone. I said, no, Lord, I forgave her. I forgave her. Well, Sometime later, she came back, and we had moved since then, moved to another house. She came and stayed with us there for a couple of days. I never even had the thought, it never even came to me, to run her, as we say, run her over the coals of what she had past done. And that was such a relief to me when she left. I, you know, it was just... It, it never flooded my mind. It never flooded my heart to think about she mistreated you. She lied on you. You borrowed $1,000 again. She still said you owed all that. It never even come to me. I said, Lord, that's real deliverance. But my heart had to keep overriding my mind. I had to keep saying it and saying it. wasn't convincing God of anything. It convincing me. You know, God's already <laughs> knew the whole situation. So... Having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, the Bible says, uh, uh, not happy or something about the feet of them. How's it? Blessed are the feet of them on the mountains that spread the good news. So it says, have your feet shod ready to walk it out. The peace, the very gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you... You're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I had wicked thoughts. I want to help God out. <laughs> you know, I'm just making this up, but I want to give her a flat tire or something. <laughs> I really didn't back then, but I just wanted her to hurt a little bit. You know, isn't it amazing how Christians want other people to hurt? It's not the Spirit of God. It is not the Spirit of Christ. It's not at all. So praying all with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. No, and taking, I forgot one, and taking the helmet of salvation. Notice all these pictures. Can you imagine putting on a helmet? He's not talking about a helmet. What if uh, the chief player decided, uh, I ain't wearing my helmet today. He's in a Super Bowl game. Or another one says, uh, I'm not wearing my shoulder pads today. What does helmets and shoulder pads and all that do to them? Protects them, but it also gives them more confidence of a, not an injury. It don't help them win the game, but it does give them confidence that they'll not get hurt. So let's understand, he's not talking about a literal helmet, he's... he's He's talking about something in the spirit. Let's put on the helmet of salvation. Let's keep our mind protected from these outward ideas and things that are shooting at us right now in 2021. Let's keep our mind protected. Remember those people that are, are doing and saying and trying to enact laws that we think we're totally against. God loves them too. It's just hard for me to. And it has been. I'm, I'm telling you. I've, I've been honest with you. It's been very difficult. And uh, I pray for my kids. I pray for my grandkids. And, you know, they're in my prayers about every time I, I talk to the Lord. It's not that anything's wrong. I just thank the Lord. They, they're serving the Lord. I, uh, I was pretty uh, upset one day. Daryl was having what we thought was cancer surgery. And I was driving for Walmart at the time, and I was wanting to get home for that surgery. I mean, that meant a lot to me to be there. He was just probably anxious to get through it, so I don't know if he even thought about me being there, but I was wanting to be there really bad, and I, I did. But he came out with a good report. 
But I think I thank the Lord for things like that, and I thank the Lord for Carla and Jamie and Sherry and the grandkids. I thank the Lord for that. They could be standing on the street corner dealing drugs and ain't not doing any of that. I thank the Lord for that. But if I'd pray for Nancy that much, I'm just being honest with you. And I have started doing that. Not as, <laughs> not as often as I should. But God's working it into my spirit. I said to, to Carrie last night, I said, you know, I'm a Trump man totally, and I don't care who knows it. But Biden will probably bring more people to their knees than Trump would. So God looks at the big picture, right? He looks at the big picture. So God is interested in everybody being drawn to himself. And it goes on to say, take the helm of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching therefore unto the preservation and supplication for all saints. I've heard a lot of preaching about this uh, being a, a, a prayer thing that you do in prayer, and I don't def refute that at all. But I just suggest to you today in closing to remember this is how to maintain joy in the middle of what everybody's scared to death at. You know, they said if we take the COVID shot, we won't have to wear a mask. Then they changed it. You got to wear a mask too. Then they said you got to take a new one, another shot. Then they said there's another strain. You know, I'm just not good with that. Pardon me, and I don't know where you're at in that, and I'm not trying to force my, my thoughts on you on that. But if I do this, see, that, that kind of stuff that you hear on the news, on the 6 o'clock news or 9 o'clock news, kind of weighs on you. And I have to say, I'm going to stand in the Spirit, and I'll have my loins girt about with truth, and I'll protect my heart. I'm not going to get scared. I'm not going to get upset. If my very best friend gets a shot, I'm not going to be mad at him or her. I don't care. I tell people, they call me all the time, what should I do? I say, follow your heart. Follow your heart. If your heart feels to do it. We're still friends. I don't plan on it, but, you know, don't, don't unfriend me, <laughs> you know. So, anyway, and above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked today is not the devil so much as it is just all these ideas that's, that comes against us comes against the kids come at school. They, they encounter so much more than, than I did when I was a kid. Man, I, I liked home. Man, I, people ask me to go home. And I got things to do, and I wanted to be at my house at night. My grandpa and grandma was the first in the area that had a TV, both black and white. Grandpa was an alcoholic and smoked them camels till his fingers was plumb brown and his, his teeth was all yellow from smoking. And when that TV would come on at night, I'd start crying if I was over at their house. I would just start bawling because I wasn't used to that background music of a movie. And I heard my grandpa say, his grandma's name was Ger Gertrude, he said, Gertie, take him home. He ain't going to shut up. And yeah, I get home, I was, I was in my safe zone because what we had before we went to bed was prayer. It wasn't some dark movie. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. <laughs> that just scared the pants off me nearly, you know. But when I was home, Dad was praying for us. Mom didn't say much. Dad did the praying, but she did the hugging. That was, that was peace for me. That was peace for me. So, and, and I, uh, I appreciate those days. I appreciate those tremendously. So, praying always. Praying in, and the supplication in the Spirit. Sometimes, just like I prayed for that woman that... that I thought mistreated our church and me. I just had to say, Lord, I love her. I love her. And you know, since I've been here in this church, I've really searched. I did a real deep 
research to try to find her because I want her to come here and speak. She's a tremendous speaker, wonderful lady. But I found out she passed, so missed it. <laughs> Amen. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I've got on the righteousness of God. And I'm going to win every battle that I Norm back there. He's going through these treatments of every day and he's extremely tired. I can understand that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for supernatural strength yes, that comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for beans and potatoes and all those other things that gives our body strength, but I tell you, Lord, I thank you for the strength that supersedes that, goes far beyond that that blesses his life, he can be strong in the middle of all of those treatments. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Linda and I is down at the house tape. We were, we've got our uh, occupancy permit, so we've been hauling little light loads of stuff, and she just puts it up, and so she takes the same box home and refills it so we kind of know where are things at. Uh, but our neighbor come running over the other night. Her husband's out the barn and he saw her running and he was scared. So he ran to meet her and she said, Mike and Linda's here. You know, we prayed for her. Her name is Brandy. Brandy will watch this. Brandy, we love you, sweetheart. She's been diagnosed with cancer and been doing a lot of treatments and it's kind of stabilized. Now they found it in her brain. And she was just crying, and Linda just took her hand, and we all joined hands, and Linda prayed for her, and she says, that just brings so much peace. So I was down last night. He come over in his golf cart real fast. He said, you got a minute? And I said, yeah. He said, in, this, in a brain surgery, it takes about... Uh, Crystal, you might have to straighten me out on this. <laughs> about three weeks to get the insurance approved and all that. And he said, I'm out three weeks before I could do it. So uh, you have to take radiation and all this chemo. He's, and while they were talking, he got a call. He took the call, and they had a surgery that was canceled this coming Monday. He said, you know what? I could just operate on you and take it out. I could do it Monday. She said, let's go for it. So she got home after that. That's just this past week. I guess that's tomorrow, right? Her surgery. And uh, she got home. She said, I forgot to ask the doctor what medications I should not take and what medicines to take. And so she, you have to do, do, call this hotline number, which is a lot of, you know, calling here and calling there. Anyway, the call went to him. No, into where he is at. He says, is that Brandy Farr? Get me take that. And he's, she asked him a question, and he's told her exactly what to do and what not to do. She says, I don't think all that's happenstance. I think that. The Holy Spirit must have orchestrated all of that, you know. 
And so right now, Brandy, we lift you up to the Lord. And I think as you have that surgery tomorrow, it's going to be okay. We pray for a successful surgery on this spot in her brain. It'll not come back. It'll not cause a future problem. And she'll live a long life. Brandy, you're going to live a long life and declare the mighty works of God. That's your responsibility. God's job to heal you. The surgeon's job to operate on you, but God's job to heal you. But it's your job to tell people what God has done for you. Father, we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody else want prayer today for anything? Anything? Let's stand. Well, I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I've got all the righteousness of God. And I'm going to win every battle that I fight. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of Because you're friendly, say something that will encourage whoever you're hugging.